everyone, it's Diane again, and we're here with another episode of Let's Have a Conversation. Today's conversation was with Rosemary Armel. Uh, I Probably she needs no introduction. I asked her to describe herself, and she said a public figure uh, and caregiver. Correct? Something to that degree. I, I, yes. I, yeah, a local celebrity, local I think. Local celebrity. That's a joke in my family. Well. And so when I asked her to have a conversation, she said, of course, so I am thrilled. Rosemary, thank you for having oh, us. Oh, anytime, you know that. Now, so this is your classroom at the Uptown campus of Stuart. What class is taught in here? This is a, a beginning news writing class. It's at AJRL 200. Very cool. And uh, so they're, they're uh, kids who are brand new. They don't know how to talk to strangers. They don't know what it's, they don't read news. It's really a challenge. It's very fun. Do they know what a newspaper is? No, 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 no. no. Yeah. Newspapers are dead. I mean, you might read a news, but it, uh, a newspaper, but it'll be online. It's not the paper version. Yeah, so. It's funny. I still like my hard copy newspaper. And you are a dinosaur. I, I know I'm a dinosaur. And uh, so they're having trouble getting carriers. So it's at least twice a week I don't get my newspaper. Which is like, and it's always like Thursday and Sunday, which are usually the, the, the ones you want to read the most, especially <laughs> Sunday, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the newspaper business, that was one of the failings when they lost all the little, usually boys, uh, because people who didn't want newspapers didn't want to disappoint the carrier, so right. they would keep it on. But then when, the, when they lost those, it was like, okay, now I don't need this newspaper every day. Yeah, it, it didn't I actually help. carried uh, Times Union at the age of nine. I can't oh, even wow. believe my parents like put me on my bike and with a little bag over your shoulder and off you went. And well, we talked about that, how, you know, when we were kids, you'd just disappear. You'd go out of the house in the morning, ride your bike all all over town. The parents didn't know where you were. You just had to be home in time for dinner, That's right? right. And, didn't worry. Yeah. and we never do that now. We would never let our kids do that. So, Rosemary, where are you originally from? Uh, right here at Colony. I was uh, I was actually born in Troy, New York, but when I, before I began kindergarten, my parents bought the house on Sand Creek Road, where I still live now. Okay, so you're one to two oh five. That's it. All right. Very, very cool. So you went to Colony High School? Colony Central, yes. Right. I'm a Raider. You're a Raider. What do you mind telling us what year no, you No, I graduated in sixty eight. Okay. It's funny, so at Colony Seniors we have a ton of people from the Colony area originally. I'm the only Shaker grad. Everybody else is Oh we didn't like Shaker. <laughs> you were you were the uppity rich kids. That's funny we I'm the only Shaker grad. So you went to, you graduated in 68. Did you go right on to college? I, I did. Um. I, I knew like from the sixth grade that I wanted to be a journalist and the only undergraduate program of note, at least at that time, was Syracuse. So I had a scholarship and I went to the Newhouse School at Syracuse University. Wow. I graduated from there in 72. And um, my college was notable. I think it's very comparable to what my kids are going through now because that was uh, 1970, mm -hmm. May of 1970 were the Kent State shootings. And there were demonstrations and uh, shutdowns of campuses across the whole country, including Syracuse. So I, I now am so empathizing with my students who in May of 2020 just went home for spring break and we never came back. It feels so much the same. Yeah, I know. It, it was sad. I feel so bad for college students, high school students when the pandemic came and the decision came to shut everything down and send everyone home for an unknown amount of time. I don't think it was fair to everybody, the psychology of it, the kids finishing up, looking forward to kind of that hurrah yeah. moment in it all going away. Well, I remember when it first happened, and you know, I was on my way for a spring vacation, which I took. It was the last time I went out of the house for, you know, 18 months after that. But um, it was like, well, this will be cool. You know, you always wish for like a snow day. This is like a super snow day. But I couldn't believe that it went on past like two weeks, I thought it would be the max. And um, here we still are, and it might be again, but yeah, it really has impacted some of these, these uh, students. I had a student come into a class 20 minutes late the other day, which was really annoying. I go, okay, so what gives? Well, she was a sophomore. She has never been to the campus before yesterday when she did this. And it's confusing if you know all the estate, all the buildings look alike, and she got lost. So yeah, it, the impacts are strange and deep. Right, yeah. yeah. No, I would agree. And it's funny because when it did happen, we were thinking the same thing. Oh, it's two weeks. Okay, maybe September. And then it just kept going and going. 
So you didn't leave your house for 18 months? Um, very little. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to say never because you, like everybody else, I built like a bubble of people mm -hmm, that sure. I felt comfortable. So my significant other lives in Western Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and I would drive over once a week. We'd have dinner. I'd stay over and then come back the next day. Mm -hmm. But see, I also take care of my mother. That's the caregiver part. She's almost 96, and mm -hmm. it's very difficult to make her understand what was happening. She would say, let's go to dinner. You want to go out? And I go, Mom, we can't. She goes, oh, I'll pay. Like it was a money issue, you know. So she never quite got that. And um, the isolation, um, you know, she does much better when there's family around and friends. And uh, my house was always a hub where people were, and we had none of that. And it, it has had an effect on her. Oh, my so, goodness. Yeah. yeah. People have aged more than the time that actually has gone by. Now, think at the age of 96, everything she lived through. Think about it. I mean, a lot. Really? And yes. I'm sure there was no other time in her life, like, okay, 18 months, you've got to stay put. You can't go. No, in fact, she talks about her mother who lived through the, the, the 1917 epidemic. Mm -hmm. And she goes, wow, I never thought I would be doing the same. I go, yeah, you know, people are going to talk. They're going to write books about it. It'll be even, it's even bigger. It's, oh, yeah. it's a worldwide one. I guess it was then too, but it, we have we have better ways to document it. Now. Yes. Don't yeah. you think people are going to write their dissertations on this and so? Oh respect? yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And of course now, because it's such a political thing, it isn't just public health. Uh, w there was some of that in 1917, but I think there'll be comparisons and contrasts. So. Right. I mean, we struggle with that as an organization. People, like you know, providing people masks, or we did a lot of vaccination clinics when we were able to. And there was, there was a line there, people chose not to do any of that based upon political whatever, which is, you know, not a good situation. I have, um, in a, another class I'm doing on digital media, I have the students, they have to find someone who feels the opposite of them about vaccination. So if you got the shot and you believe in it, you have to find a resistor, vice versa. And they have to speak to them respectfully and civilly mm -hmm. and try to find out why they think the way they do, who they have listened to, um, what, if anything, evidence or person could change their sure. mind? And try to get dig deeper into why this public health crisis has become, uh, you know, so politicized and so fraught with. It's 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 just tragic. It I is. So that's that. a great assignment, though. Who is influencing? Yeah. And is it the internet, or is it a particular person, or a particular periodical? Exactly. And I and I'm doing it myself with them. I have a cousin who's just. She believes we're on the path to Nazi Germany, that we'd have to carry a little card if you want to go to a restaurant or a supermarket or even hold a job, and that's that's horrible. Right, right. I know the alternative isn't so hot either. I no, think. death and <laughs> ventilators, thank you. <laughs> so now we're going to go back. So after Syracuse University, you graduated in 72. What was your next chapter? Uh, <laughs> I was the valedictorian of my class, right? Good for you. But this was 1970, well, when I graduated, 1972. So I wanted to come back and work on my hometown newspaper, the Knickerbocker News at the time, or the Times Union. And I was told, well, you know, we just hired a woman. So they didn't need another one. So I ended up working at the Gloversville Leader Herald. Um, I had a license, but I had been at college, I had never driven, so I started every day, which is the most memorable thing to me, driving 52 miles up the thruway to Gloversville, try that in the middle of winter. I really did learn how to drive that time. And I covered the YMCA, the YWCA, and the Jewish Community Center. It was not scintillating journalism, but that's where I began. And, you know, within a few months, I ended up at the Nick News, and I worked okay. locally, and then after 1975, so like three years later, I moved um, uh, to the uh, UPI, which is like the Associated Press at the time. And from there, I moved out to Ohio and worked there. I worked for the wire services for a long time. That was very fun. So if you have to look back on your career in journalism, you would say, would that be like the chapter? The chapter doing that? Oh no! I went. I went on to bigger things in oh. journalism. My my roots were small. This was journalism has like many things sped up, mm -hmm. and so you can get out of school now and go right to name it the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. You could not do that in the seventies, especially if you were a woman, and uh, they didn't hire minorities in in many numbers and at all, which is, I'm not saying this was a good thing, I'm not looking back on it, and the golden days was terrible. But you started in small papers and you moved up and up and up, and uh, the newsrooms were filled with a mix of people. There were people who had been there for 50 years, and they were the, the models. And you, and, 
But now you go into newsrooms, they're not like they were. They're, there's fewer people. Uh, they're much more diverse, but they're all young. Uh, it's not a, it's the newsrooms that I remember and think of fondly don't exist anymore. Well, people and, retired from those newsrooms. And, or were, they took layoffs. You know? yeah. they, they just were booted out because they, they earned too much money. Journalism is, it's, it's an, an economic problem right now to be a journalist. It's hard to be a journalist financially. I was very lucky. I, my whole career was as a journalist. I got to see the world, uh, did met it, wonderfully interesting people, and worked on big stories. And there aren't going to be too many people who are going to be able to do that in the future. I think it'll be a, a part-time or a par partial career. You move on to something else, or you figure out a way to do it in new and different ways. CNN is hiring like 200 people, the Washington Post is hiring, but they're not straight journalists anymore now either. They're kind of like um, online engineers as well, podcasts and, and uh, data journalism. It's just changed. I'm not sure I'd be a journalist if I were just starting out again these days. Changed that much, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, we're back to how do people get their information? And is that information they're getting even accurate? You know, who's, who's influencing it? Why do they go to a particular station or you know a particular podcast or you yeah. know how accurate is that? Yeah, well, you know, maybe the ethics of journalism. I'm teaching a whole course on this. I'll sign you up if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's amazing because so in our lifetime, people you know you always, I know when I took writing classes when I was in college, they talked about primary source, secondary source. Right. You know that you truly had to make sure whatever you were stating that you didn't plagiarize, right. and whatever you were stating had some fact behind it. Right. Well, that was when you held on to the story until it was fully developed and mm -hmm. vetted. Right. You don't do that now. You lose the story if you do right. it. And everything has become, like as we were talking about with COVID, it's become politicized. So if you hold up a story on Hunter Biden and his laptop or on Nancy Pelosi trading on insider information, well, Breitbart isn't holding back. The, the, the Twitter is not holding back. And so you look like you're taking a biased stand mm -hmm. That used to be fact checking. Now it's somehow separate from writing a story or coming broadcasting a story. But you know, for me, I went into journalism. And it was after Watergate, and um, I wanted to change the world. And journalism seemed like a path that you could do it if you only told people more information. If you told them the truth, that they would they would rise up and demand justice. That's journalism of outrage and investigative reporting. And we have found in the digital age it's not true. The more you tell people facts, they say, that's not facts, that's your opinion. And then they dig in and trench their own position. So I, I, I think if I wanted to change the world, which I still would like to, um, I, and I was starting over, it would be um, politics or law. I think those are the, the areas where you can make a difference these days. I'm not so sure. Some journalism does, don't get me wrong, and I, I, I so admire my investigative colleagues, but um, it's, I, I don't think I would do it today. It's interesting you say politics or law, so I look at politics and I feel like that is so weighted one way or the other, and sometimes the truth doesn't come out in that arena. And then law, I mean, you see so many lawyers who are censored because of what they're oh. doing or what they shouldn't be doing. What they are. Yes, I've read those stories too about yeah. Mr. Giuliani. <laughs> well, you know, um, it's true, but uh, you know, the Thurgood Marshall is the model. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, yeah. uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, my yeah. hero. Um, they, they change life for, yeah. for millions of people because of the power of their argument in a court of law. That's very, very appealing. And the same with the politician. Yeah, there are some well, even the bad ones, let's take Cuomo, he's certainly got his comeuppance. And yet, marriage equality and uh, gun regulation and equality for women are a fact in New York State because of him. As a politician, you can change the world. Do you, I'm just curious what your opinion is on term limits. I, I, you know, I often joke, if I went back to finish my doctorate, I would do something about the life cycle of a politician. And the only thing I would do is somebody says, oh, I want to be a public servant. I would measure the circumference of their head. <laughs> and say, <laughs> well, I'm office, how large that got. Because I, I do, I think sometimes power is corrupted. Uh, always. I mean, that's Machiavelli figured that out how many centuries ago. Uh, I am in favor of term limits. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I like to see some creative use of it, like you can only do two terms at a time and then take a break and come back. That might be interesting. But, um, you know, even FDR, he should not have run that last term. He's, he's the one who, who brought it in on the presidential level. He should not have run that last term. He was a dying man and he knew it. Um, and he felt that it, it would be more dangerous to leave and let someone else come in to, to execute the conclusion of the war. Uh, that's hubris, that's, that's pride. It was, it was a medical country, it was a mess after that, and we're lucky that Truman was able to deal with it, but what, what if it had been someone new and fresh? And, right. um, I, 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 yeah, uh, almost every, I can't think of a person who's been, even Nancy Pelosi, who I much admire, um, I was calling for her to leave after Obama. She, she lost a lot of seats in, uh, in the House, and she must be responsible for that. Um, she was fabulous with Trump, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's time for her to go too. Yeah. And Nancy Feinstein, oh my God, that's a sin. She's senile. She should not be. She should not be in office at all. Mm -hmm. She was a great woman, and the end of her career is now tarnished. Mm -hmm. And it's not just women. Orrin Hatch did the same thing. You know, if you're on the other side of the political yeah. spectrum. It's interesting that even beyond politics, oftentimes people, you know, I would say, okay, you're at the pinnacle of your career. Don't you want to leave when you're up here than if you're, you know, if you're defeated or if you really stumble or, you know, I don't know, are people not concerned with legacy or how the history books will be interpreting them 20 years? Well, you don't, years? you don't think that you're going to stumble. I mean, Diane yeah. Feinstein was uh, outraged that she was not selected as her party's candidate again, as she has been for, you know, decades. Um, she didn't think that, oh, I'm going to falter and I can't do it anymore. You, you always think that you can do it. And there's also something about even local celebrity. I love it when people say, oh, I listen to you all the time. They'll come up to you in the airport. I was talking to my granddaughter the other day when I took her home. And somebody just came up and said, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I listen to you every morning. That is very heady. And I laugh at it and make jokes about it, but I, I do recognize that. that you want to keep that. And so you stay longer than you should. Yeah, yeah. No, I would absolutely agree. So let's talk about the round table and the WAMC, because that's how a lot of people know you. It is. I'm I'm shocked by the the reach of the round table yeah. and the media project yeah. too, and WAMC and Alan Shartok. I'm I'm stunned by it. Um, um, I, I had Alan uh, invited me. I, I have him to thank for that. Um, and I think he had actually asked a number of other women who are smarter and more qualified than I was. But, but there's a thing in women that they're saying, oh, uh, no, I don't have time to prepare. And uh, oh, I, I don't know anything about this. I can't talk about it. And I just said, sure, I'll talk about it. Just like to you. Yeah, 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 we can talk about anything. So I went on and, I, and, um, and I've learned a ton about it. So I'd love to do a podcast sometime. To um, be, as you are, this is this is it's fun, right? Yeah. Uh, and you learn a lot, and you you um, uh, it's not boring. No. I like not to be bored. You know, I think the pandemic, this human to human contact, even though it's going to be electronic, is important because you may think, oh, I know her because I listen to her, but to sit down and actually have a conversation, yeah. with kind of like your assignment. Find right. somebody who doesn't think like you and talk to them. Exactly right. That and that is, yeah, that that's journalism. It's mm. communication, absolutely. Yeah. We're, and we're not doing enough of that in this right. country. Yeah. We we go on Facebook and write uh, very well written, actually, but um, uh, impersonal screeds uh, or letters of support, and then we don't do anything else, and that's really dangerous. Yeah. So. Now, like at least groups, the, the legal women voters, you know, to, where do you see, do you have an opinion on that? Because, you know, that was in person, these debates, and, you know, I, I don't hear from those groups as often as yeah, they, they have before. They, they can't compete with, um, you know this, even the seniors, right? That's a, a wonderful organization. And, um, uh, but to get people out of their house in bad weather, uh, we saw it at the library too. I worked in the library and we would have these great programs and lectures and you know, a handful of people would come because it's just easier to open that screen and you know, you can talk to people that way by typing. Uh, we've lost a lot. I, and now I sound like a dinosaur. Uh, we've gained a lot too because it's a much wider group of people. Uh, it's around the world. It's all the time, and so that's a plus too. And, uh, right. There's more people in that conversation sharing their opinions. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So there is a positive to that. 
you know, and, and even these individuals we just talked about who have kind of faltered and have lost their pinnacle, they're now, you know, I am always okay with that veneer showing its cracks. Right. Because then that hopefully will bring about change. It may not be the change we want, but it, it's continually changing. Right. And right. there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it, it's hard to think back, I, and you're, you're making me do this by recalling, you know, 1968 college, how everything has changed, you know, phone calls, you see people now, you know, and, uh, and it doesn't cost a whole lot to talk to someone who lives far away. Long, remember when long distance was, oh, don't take the phone call, it's true. Yeah, ev everything has changed, and um, it, it, this course that I'm teaching, I never taught it before, but that's what I'm fascinated by is um, it has an impact on you. There's an article they're reading, um, pretty famous in the university, called, Is Google Making Us Stupid? Mm -hmm. We don't read anymore. We search, uh, we search in a book for information or for the key points. Mm -hmm. We don't read long, deep, involving, difficult stories. We don't want difficult anymore. It's making us stupid. And it's get, making us lazy. I would agree with you. Yeah. yeah. No, there's something absolutely to be said. You're, you're making me feel like I, I, it's time to definitely retire no. in full because I, 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 mean, I should be, I should be like, oh, the opportunities here. It's so exciting. I want to get into it. It's like, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> well, look how busy you are. You know, and, I, and I'm saying that with the, the greatest of compliments. You know, you're, you're here at SUNY, you're teaching. It's not even SUNY anymore. Too old. Right, and you are. You have to right, say so. that, yes. Hey, and, and then how often are you on the radio? Uh, uh, twice a week on the roundtable, and then I do twice a month on the media project. But yeah. that's, you know, that's a busy schedule. And you're a caregiver. Yeah, so, now, that's the real job. I'm sure your mom depends on, on you a lot, so there's that whole, like, I, I don't think there's a harder job in this world than a caregiver. Yeah. Whether it's for children or adults, for you to be that person responsible for another, I, I find a lot of similarities. I have three kids, they're all grown now, but I, I, it, it does recall those days where it's not really difficult work. You know, it doesn't require like a, a, an advanced degree or special training, but you're on all the time. And um, I'll find that my mother will go in for a nap, and I, it's the same way as I felt when those kids went down. It's like, yes! A half an hour to myself, oh yes! <laughs> and so, you know, just uh, keeping up a conversation and um, um, making sure there's food in the house and cleaning up after the cats and yeah it, it's not difficult it certainly is not the um, it won't change the world but I, I feel so strongly like it's a duty my mother took care of my grandmother her mother until you know she died at 101 so wow. this is not this is a, a this is a debt being paid right so. and my sisters are great too they, they all we don't have a family uh, disunity over this. That's so, great. It's great. How, actually, how fortunate you are to have your mom at 96 oh, still living aware. independent. We are aware. Yes, yeah. we know that. But I think a caregiver needs to truly be empathetic and needs to be a saint with their patients. Um, yeah. yeah that, <laughs> When you make um, a sacrifice, like I quit working overseas and came home and I saw how, how much my mother needed it. Um, when you make a sacrifice like that, it has to be done, and my mother, this is a lesson from mom, graciously and fully. And that means like, um, okay, this was really hard today, I'm not going to bitch, can I say bitch on your TV? You can't bitch about it or complain, you can't, um, uh, you can't say, oh, woe is me, I wish you were different. Um, so. But the, the sisters are also good at this because they realize what a good deal they had. If they were paying for it, how man, that would cost them some money. I'm protecting their legacy here, <laughs> their bequeath. Uh, but you know, they're, they ask all the time, how's it going, do you need a break? And they'll come down. I, I just went to a wedding in Utah and another sister came and stayed with mom then. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, respite's important. That yeah, really is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so is teaching. You know, I'm, I'm among young people, I, I, I don't just, uh, isolation that my mother feels, I don't want to feel it either. Right, so. right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, so international, so before all the pandemic and you coming home, the last time you were in Tunisia. The, uh, Tunisia, no, I, the last place was Amman, Jordan. I spent the last two years before, I came back in 19, so just before March of 2020 and everything mm -hmm. shut down, I came back from uh, the Middle East and um, I missed travel viciously. Right after I got vaccinated, I had a chance to travel to uh, North Macedonia. And um, doing it, it at the time, 
this little window that opened up in, uh, in March of this year uh, was the place with the lowest infection rate in Europe. So, and I had been vaccinated, so I said, I'm going. And I went over, it was ridiculous, because by the time I got there, they had one of the surges like we're experiencing now. And I ended up going all that way to teach essentially a Zoom class, because most of the kids were afraid to come into the classroom for the lectures. Um, and I came right back home, because you couldn't go to any of the tourist places or uh, museums. Everything was closed. There was a lockdown. But I still liked just being, I even appreciated the TSA. I got out of the country for a minute. And I'm, I'm waiting. I have a trip lined up in uh, December. I'm hoping things will be OK then, but we'll see. I, I love to travel. And uh, I, I have gone into debt for it. And I will, uh, I, and that's why I continue to work, make a little money to go uh, for, uh, for airplane tickets, you know. <laughs> Where is some of the most interesting places you feel you've traveled, whether it's for work or pleasure? Well, Mongolia it has okay. to be at the top of the list. It's not a place I ever expected to go. I did a, some trainings there, and it's so remote and has absolutely no history, not even a nanosecond in common with the United States. That was very cool. Um, Poland was a big surprise. Again, when you work in media development, that's what I do, work with you know, emerging press. You go to places that are not Italy or Greece, which are also beautiful, but um, you go to interesting places in Poland. Um, not a tourist attraction. Warsaw is a really, it's just a work in a city, but oh my God, the spirit. That, that city was destroyed by the Nazis uh, next to Jews, uh, Hitler hated Poles. And so he, he determined he was going to just obliterate, and he almost succeeded in obliterating the country, just flattened it, 85% to destroy. And they built it back. They didn't get hit by the Soviets, so this was not an easy right, thing to do. Right. They're also still under subjugation. But they built that city back in the model, not a new city, just the way it was, you know, with the, with the, uh, the centuries old architecture and designs. They rebuilt it. I, I love that spirit. And so we're sitting in the middle of Prague in a park uh, where cottonwood trees were just dispensing into the air, stuff that looked like snow, listening to a Chopin concert. And the statue of Chopin was right next to the uh, piano. It had been destroyed by the Nazis and they put it back together. I, that's one of I loved Poland, of all places. Um, but my heart is really in Bosnia and Sarajevo. I've been there multiple times and I love it. It's The former Yugoslavia is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Completely horrible, troubled human history, but uh, a beautiful place, sort of like Italy without all the crowds. <laughs> I actually taught in Poland for a summer. Oh, wow. I, yeah, which was interesting. So, yeah, I would agree. Warsaw. I love Krakow. I, I went there too, also yeah. in that castle. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah, I yeah. just, it's, it's, yeah. But it's funny because I was, I went there and I taught American English and culture. And it was great. It's it really pretty oh. intensive, no air conditioning. Things we take for granted, they didn't have. Yeah, I was yeah. like talking to you about international yeah. stuff. You've had a different but equally fascinating Yeah, and I think it's fun to kind of go to something off the beaten track yep. and actually have the opportunity to, because uh, I know some of the photos you shared with us are, are you probably working with young individuals yes. in journalism or yeah. media. Yeah. And that's so, I'm sure they're thrilled to have that had that experience. I, I have this one which I, I rejected to send to. Maybe, maybe now I have to because I'm going to talk about it. But it was in Minsk um, and uh, in Bel Belarus, which is having such a hard time now. But I was there before all the troubles. And two young girls, they're you know, young enough to be my granddaughters, and they had been in the training. And the idea of uh, someone who could be um, uh, important and still passionate, as old as I am, in their field. That was a, like an unintended role model. They were so cute. Oh my God, they were so cute. And, and that happens all over, you know, when you when you do uh, journalism training. It's really very satisfying. You do come across that you're excited. Yeah, I, I do. Think I about how many people are in positions or, or jobs that they can't stand. They count, okay, I'll be out of here in four hours, or I can retire in three years, four months, and two days, or whatever that is. You know, I my mean, my youngest son is okay. one of them, oh. and he he has told me that um, it's a uh, he's envious. He wishes he wants to find what I have, which is that you know at seventy I'm still thrilled by. Um, uh, achievements or anything that I do, that much less my colleagues, uh, a story that's well told, uh, or a, especially investigative news when you find out something that you're not supposed to know. And still, and I do still do have that sense of uh, 
wow, oh man, better than sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I assume a lot of people are envious or they want what you want. They want that positive energy. Yeah. You may be uncovering things that aren't real pleasant, but that you're able to do that and correspond and talk to people about it. Yeah. I was telling the students today about, you know, in an interview when someone says to you, you know, not a wife telling you this. Yes, <laughs> I want you to. Or uh, I've never told anyone this, but it's like, oh, yeah. So is everything on the record? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, nice. What advice would you give uh, a young person or even an older person who's thinking about maybe, I'm so unhappy where I am and I'd like to do something else. What advice would you give them? Oh, wow. And advice maybe that I got once uh, from, it was an editor of Jet Magazine called Okay. Gave a lecture. She said, uh, in life, should I stop? In life, it's um, never too late. Yeah. You can start over, you can redo, you can quit. You know, retirement, is, that's an adventure too. Uh, and it's never too late. So, but you have to kind of know yourself. Like, what is it you want? Right, right. I have, my mother never wanted anything more than to raise a big family and have them all successful. So she raised five daughters. We're all, I think my sisters are amazing. And, uh, but that wasn't enough. No, you just reached your first goal. You didn't set a second one. So what do you want to do now? Right. And she told me recently she had never seen an owl. So I dragged her out my 95 at the time year old mother in the middle of winter to go see a woman up in Rotterdam. Who had an owl? She rescues owls. Mm -hmm. That's but then it's off the bucket list. Exactly. See, that's so cool. Yeah. Yep. I, you know, I know that regardless of your age, I think having chapters. Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes you think, oh, this is what I want. And then you realize, yeah, this isn't. Some chapters are short and don't end well, and other things are long and then beautiful. Okay, now that's good advice. The next time I get asked a question, I'm going to say, well, as Diane said once. <laughs> you know, you think sometimes you're recruited, sometimes you're fired. You know, it's like, it's not, and that's okay. Yeah. You know? yeah. If you can have enough courage or strength to say, I, I can carry on, you know, this, I will find my purpose, or right. I'm happy. Right, right. Or is there a purpose, you know, yeah. that. Um, my, my mother's facing end of life, so I think about it too, and she's, she keeps saying, I feel so useless. Isn't that an interesting, I mean, it's sad that she says that, and you know, of course we jolly her out of it as you're supposed to, but isn't that an interesting, who is useful? You know, you, you are temporarily, if you're a mother and you have young children, of course you're useful, but really, humans don't serve a real use, do we? Right, right, and a lot of ours is maybe we describe what we're feeling more important than we really are. Yeah, that makes sense, so. it does make sense, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm beginning to think that the secret of life is finding things that make you have the small joys and you don't have to have a bigger purpose. That's just like an exercise in futility mm -hmm. to try to find that. It's so funny you say that there was something, on, I, sometimes I wake up and go, I can't, you know, go back to bed. And I turned on PBS and they had this documentary, this, this graduate student who followed this farming family. They got into dairy farming. A young couple played it, like three or four kids. And it was like they were losing their shirts because, you know, everything costs and milk isn't, you know, yeah. <laughs> they don't a lot of it. And then they tried to go into cheese making and they were doing well and then something burnt down. I was like, oh my gosh. But they struggled through it. And the, this young woman, this mother, she said, you know, that what gets me through the day is everything I do, I try to find some joy in it. Yeah. And I think, you know, as simple, especially during this pandemic and whether we're going to shut down again or wear a mask or whatever, nobody knows what tomorrow's going to bring to find joy in what we're doing. Oh my gosh, yes. Okay, so I found gardening. I mean, did you know that vegetables have beautiful flowers on them? I, I, I didn't know that. I, I, I've been eating them all my life. I didn't know. I'm growing them now. I, I just love it. And um, eating, oh my God, ice cream can make you smile now. Ah, there's always joy in ice cream. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, what are you growing in your garden? Oh, um, well, I just signed up for the Master Gardener program. So ask me that question. I know. I'm so excited. And I hope I have the time. I'm going to talk about being busy. I'm yeah. going to be up tonight going through all the paper. Work. Um, but I just, um, I have a big lawn, 
and I hate grass. I hate mowing it. It seems like such a waste of time. So I just had a neighbor with a rotor tiller just dig up like a, it's about maybe a little bit bigger than this desk I'm sitting at. And I just threw in a bunch of plants. And there's tomatoes and potatoes and cabbage and eggplant and peppers, three different kinds of tomatoes. And I said, okay, well, whatever grows, that'll be great. They'd all grow. It's a jungle. It's a freaking jungle in my, in my lawn. I love it. So next year it's going to be twice as big and we're going to do beans and corn and pumpkins. Yeah. <laughs> well, depending on what you grew this year, because of all the heat and the rain. It's amazing. Oh, I, yes, I should have brought you a bag of tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cucumber, squash. I got all of it. It's amazing. Good for you. You just yeah. have a little farm stand. On San That's what my mother wants to do. We'll, uh, do. Just put it out there. I got give it away. She goes, no, no, no. We'll just sell it. Yeah, we'll make some money. I hope. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for taking the time to have Oh, this was fun. Yeah, it was. It was incredibly enjoyable. I, I feel very fortunate to have you as a friend, and I Me think too. the SUNY system or the ULB system should be fortunate they have you as oh. a teacher, and thank goodness you're still in WAMC because a lot of people <laughs> listen because they want to listen to you. Thank you. That's really nice. So thank you. On behalf of our staff and board directors, Rosemary Armand, thank you for having me. My pleasure. <laughs>